very very strange way to meet your voice is breaking that may be because some of us have not muted yeah i was saying it's a life has become very strange to be meeting like this uh, may i request uh, that that we keep ourselves on mute and as the attendees all join the session just a couple of minutes for the technical at the back end and uh, we will meet all the panel in us and we start in a couple of minutes uh, please mute yourself Sunday will go first, just in week Sunday. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, we will just begin our program. Uh, I will request everyone to mute themselves. Apologies, we had to start a couple of minutes late uh, due to a technical uh, problem at our end. I will just begin by uh, by introduction and setting the context for today's webinar. Welcome to the uh, FIKI webinar on the impact of COVID-19 on achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. I am Rita Roy Chaudhary, Assistant Secretary General FIKI. And we have a very distinguished panel of experts on this webinar with us today. A very diverse and interesting audience as well comprising policymakers, corporates, think tanks, foundations, and NGOs. FIKI has been staging many discussions on the role of corporate sector in achieving the SDGs, on the link between corporate sustainability at the micro level to the SDGs at the macro level. And many of our policy deliberations revolve around areas of climate change, clean energy, clean air, water, sanitation, waste management, biodiversity, sustainable mobility, sustainable cities, circular economy, responsible production, consumption, improved health, role of innovation, and the intersection of technology, policy, and finance in each of these areas. FIKI has always laid great importance to the need for identifying, replicating, and scaling up best practices of businesses on their innovation and stewardship of environmental and social factors. We also believe that while SDGs are top-down, the bottom-up insights and practical implementation by the corporate sector would help uh, to throw light on how SDGs can be fast-tracked with corporate contribution and initiatives. This year is the fifth anniversary of the SDGs and exactly a decade away from the achievement target of 2030. And this year, is, the world is also grappling with the worst ever pandemic witnessed by humankind. The COVID-19 pa pandemic has pushed all organizations to reinvent the way they operate and find a new equilibrium. However, every crisis presents an opportunity. It is an opportune time for organizations, especially for business and industry, to evaluate how they can build business resilience to global or local crises. It demands that everyone calibrate their businesses long term strategies to build in the risk related metrics that would help them shield against future shocks in the system and adapt quickly. It is therefore becoming an imperative to look at long term resilience from the lens of the SDGs 
and transition to becoming SDG compatible for the future. We are already uh, seeing that there is a lot of direct impact the current crisis is having and would have some of these are good impacts like we're seeing on air pollution, waste management and other aspects. Uh, the new normal will continue to have various new norms that would impact the way people work, live and travel. It would be important to see what impact new norms would also have uh, in terms of policy formulation for the future. For today's webinar, I will actually uh, give reference to the UN Financing for Sustainable Development Report 2020, which is the latest piece of work uh, that talks about the impact of COVID-19 on the SDGs and how financing must be channeled to, towards the SDGs despite this huge pandemic that we are seeing. Uh, what it does refer to is the rising risk of a global recession and, that, and the disproportionate suffering that one will see. The immediate focus it talks about must be on reversing the trajectory of the COVID-19 pandemic and responding to the unfolding economic crisis. And also the fact that there will be spent more of public health spending, concessional lending programs, etc. How will this really have an impact on spending for other SDG uh, goals? Uh, the report does talk about reversing the backslide that we are seeing in the commitments for the SDGs, raising ambition on climate mitigation adaptation, making the most of the opportunities that arise from the digital technologies, and that we are at a decade of action to deliver sustainable development goals. Uh, I, I am I'm, uh, referring to this report because uh, one, that it is the latest piece of work and also what it talks about has great relevance in the way that policymakers, financiers, and the private sector can really gear themselves towards the SDGs. Uh, it also talks about the growing investment, uh, growing uh, interest in sustainable uh, investing. So there are many aspects of this UN report uh, on financing for the SDGs. And uh, closer home, uh, the Niti Aayog also released the Sustainable Development Index uh, 2.0, version 2.0 in December 2019. Again, which talks about how the SDGs can be monitored uh, at an India level. And the fact that it is already universally acknowledged that India's success in achieving the SDGs will also determine the global outcomes. Uh, and that uh, the various government programs that have been outlined have already mainstreamed uh, SDGs in, the, in India's development strategy. So while uh, we are seeing that the focus of all these reports are talking about, particularly the UN report talks about the economic and financial so shocks associated with COVID-19, and that it is already derailing the tepid economic growth and compounding heightened risks from other factors. This is going to make sustainable finance more difficult and further undermine the ability to achieve the SDGs. This is what I'm quoting from this UN report. And so taking from this I, uh, and, you know, to introduce our key panelists, we have Ms. Nenalal Kidwai, past president FIKI. In her past roles as chair of the FIKI UNEP inquiry on the design of a sustainable financial system for India, Chairman of HSBC India, and in her current role of Chairman Advent Private Equity, Chair of Picky Water Mission, and Chair of the India Sanitation Coalition, is certainly a powerful voice to bring into this discussion. We also have with us Mr. Atul Bagai, Country Head of UN Environment in India, probably the most appropriate person on the panel to reflect on the UN's report coming from the UN system himself and uh, this being the most recent piece of work that highlights the impact of COVID. Uh, the, these rep uh, reports also talk about the rapid growing interest in sustainable investing. Uh, when we talk of sustainable investing, there's no better person here on the panel with us uh, who is Dr. Mukund Rajan. He's the chair of the FIKI Environment Committee and chair, uh, chairman of eCube Investment Advisors. 
He has also held previously the position of chairman of Tata Sustainability Council and brand custodian of the Tata Group. So a really important voice in, in the world of sustainable investing and particularly in the context of India. We also have joining Dr. Rajan uh, along with him, Mr. Shankar Venkateshwaran, operating partner and head of ESG engagement, who was a key member of the committee set up by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs on the national guidelines for responsible business conduct, linked very much directly to corporate sustainability. Uh, the report really refers to also the private sector gradually realizing that business as usual is not the future and that a transition to, towards more sustainability is key to the long-term financial success of companies. And pointing in that direction, I think we Tata, from Tata Chemicals, she's the head of uh, the, uh, the sustainability group in, the, in Tata Chemicals. And joining her is Ms. Rinika Grover, who's also the chief sustainability officer of Apollo Tires. Two of the large corporates from India at the forefront of corporate sustainability with a global footprint. And I'm sure they would provide a very important corporate perspective on not, not just the impact of COVID-19 on achievement of SDGs, but the impact of COVID-19 on their own company's sustainability goals. So after having introduced the theme and the panel, the very interesting panel that we have here with us today, I will hand over to Dr. Mukund Rajan, Chairman of FIKI Environment Committee to take over the proceedings. Dr. Rajan. Um, thanks so much, uh, Rita, and very good morning to our very distinguished panel. Uh, I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on the topic, really reiterating some of the points that uh, Rita made before we get started with the first panelist. Um, as, as Rita mentioned, uh, India's role in achieving its SDG targets is now well acknowledged to be fundamental to the global achievement of the SDG targets. Uh, this is partly because of uh, India's large population. We account for 17% of the global population. And uh, equally importantly, the growing size of the Indian economy. Uh, we are today already the third largest producer of greenhouse gas emissions in the world. And perhaps on an incremental basis through this decade, we may well on an incremental basis overtake the United States and then China. Uh, we are all aware of a number of actions that are ongoing to tackle the challenges presented by COVID-19. The immediate focus is clearly on reversing the trajectory of the COVID-19 pandemic and responding to the unfolding economic crisis. While many of these actions are necessary, uh, they do raise legitimate concerns about whether some of the focus on SDGs, for instance, SDG 13 on taking urgent action to tackle climate change, or SDG 3 on addressing a variety of health-related issues including importantly tuberculosis in India, is getting diluted in the near term. Uh, at a time of declining economic growth, we have heard understandable calls from several quarters within industry for relaxing some of the compliance burdens in corporate India. But these have equally aroused concerns among stakeholders, including environmental activists, that important environmental compliance requirements should not take a back seat just now. If anything, uh, many communities are actually experiencing, thanks to successive lockdowns, a far cleaner quality of air and water than they have experienced in recent decades, and would be loath to lose that in the quest for reviving economic growth. So the question uppermost in my mind is the following. Having learned a lot about tackling a global issue, a global epidemic like COVID-19, and its attendant possibly once in a lifetime, adverse impact on the global economy, can we convert this learning, as Rita mentioned, into an opportunity to address the SDGs more effectively than we might have earlier considered possible? Can we use some of this learning to deal with the global environmental challenge of climate change? Can we bring together stakeholders in partnership, including industry and government, to address fundamental questions about the quality of life all humankind aspires for. 
Can the kind of whole of government approach we are seeing being marshaled for tackling COVID-19 be adopted for delivering the SDG targets by 2030? So these are some of the issues on which I'm hoping we'll get some steer from all our excellent panelists. Uh, I think what we'll do is we'll have each of the panelists make their opening remarks. And then after they've all finished, I will address some questions to them. And finally, we will open up to some questions from the audience. So uh, let's get started then. Uh, the first speaker I would like to turn to is uh, Naina Lal Kidwai. So I request Naina to make her opening remarks, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mukund. And as usual, uh, your very thoughtful uh, remarks and uh, Rita too, on uh, how we might uh, convert this uh, whole uh, COVID uh, pandemic into an opportunity. And uh, what I will do is uh, focus really on the, the two SDGs which uh, I work in, which is water and sanitation, through my experience at the India Sanitation Coalition. And uh, I can uh, certainly tell you that uh, for us, this is an opportunity, a huge opportunity. If you look at how much effort and work uh, went in to uh, last five, six years through the Swachh Bharat mission of government, the kind of work which many NGOs, uh, civil society, corporates supported, and what we were also doing at the India Sanitation Coalition, it was on behavior change in terms of hygiene, wash, and uh, making sure that people understood this. And that huge communication effort, dare I say, is helping us now as a country, I'm sure. Because while the challenge remains, and it's a huge challenge in terms of water supply, uh, so let's not kid ourselves in terms of uh, have we made it easier for people to have water? No. But did we at least bring about the awareness of hygiene and hand washing? Yes. And I can only hope that COVID uh, certainly pushes us to look at the whole hand washing agenda, provision of water and behavior change in terms of the way we wash and how we wash uh, right at the forefront. And I think we in the sanitation world are certainly pushing ahead, aligning what we were doing anyway with making it a much more COVID uh, uh, oriented uh, messaging to really enhance the urgency of this as we go forward. So uh, improved access to water sanitation clearly contributes to economic development. Uh, I don't have to tell any of you that. It helps with poverty reduction. It helps with uh, education and most importantly, with the health agenda. And uh, therefore, SDG 6.1, 6.2, I believe, will see focus. My worry is that the amount of funding available as a country on any agenda right now looks reduced as the government struggles to allocate whatever little elbow room it has into areas which it deems as critical. And unfortunately, most of it will be in terms of helping with the outcomes rather than helping with the health agendas that ensure that people don't get uh, that is when I mean outcome, I mean, you know, the actual patient, the actual critical care, the actual hospitalization, whereas, in fact, if we had the pre hospitalization uh, agenda through SDG 6.1, 6.2 and other health agendas under control, you mentioned TB, uh, then that uh, need to actually spend the kind of money which we're now going to have to spend on the uh, medical system will actually go down. Uh, so. Is there a possibility that countries like ours reallocate internal resources to increase the supply of safe water? Well, the good news is that the government had announced before this uh, the uh, water provision of water to every household agenda, and uh, that was to cost the sum of 3.6 lakh crores. Uh, I can only hope that that agenda stays on course and that companies align behind it uh, to support it in every way as uh, we see going forward. And uh, then if we look at the whole area of end-to-end uh, uh, -end, uh, uh, sanitation and the whole uh, ODF agenda, 
while there has been no conclusive evidence of uh, fecal sludge treatment and COVID uh, situation, except to say that it is easy to test fecal sludge to determine if COVID-19 uh, exists in a community. Uh, one can only assume, as studies happen, that as is the case with other viruses, it is believed that viruses survive very well in fecal sludge. So I would hope that our push in terms of sanitation and treatment will also get the attention which it was beginning to get even through the Swaj Bharat uh, uh, agenda, but even more so now as health and sanitation stay at the forefront given uh, the uh, horrible economic effects of uh, sanitation. So I, I would think, uh, you know, narrowing down the specific areas uh, which matter, uh, where we can, in fact, push the agenda forward. And I would just add the third, which is the work from home, which has been this, that to my mind is the most biggest uh, change uh, that has happened. And uh, I was just seeing a survey of Fortune 500 CEOs, so it's a global one, where the one factor which stands out is air travel. And that's fabulous for us in the environment, that 51% said, 51% of global CEOs actually say that they are pretty certain that air travel is not going to return to the levels it did before. And 60% have said that business travel will be replaced by VCs. So this is already what global CEOs are predicting. So let us push on this agenda in terms of how that helps in terms of the carbon footprint. And of course, the whole area of pollution, urban infrastructure, and the way we plan our cities is going to be key. And within that uh, slums, and uh, the way they work, because we have seen the intensity of disease, how it can spread through the slums and that environment, which uh, Bombay is facing every day today, and as we do in fact have across our cities, uh, I do hope that we can address that urban infrastructure challenge as well. So that's all from me, Mukun. thank you. Lovely, thank you so much, Naina, and uh, we'll be coming back to the question of uh, work from home, digital infrastructure, implications of jobs, all of that in, in a short while. Uh, let me turn now to um, Atul. Um, Atul, could you go next with your opening remarks, please? You will have to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Sorry for that. Uh, I uh, thanks uh, Mukund and uh, thanks Rita for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, give a UN perspective and you rightly pointed out to uh, this report that has recently come out uh, and it certainly uh, highlights uh, where the global effort for SDGs uh, stands vis-a-vis -vis the present pandemic. Uh, I would like to contextualize some of the key parts of that report to uh, the Indian context and uh, Naina mentioned uh, a very significant point about uh, water, uh, and that certainly is uh, a very key area which uh, we need to uh, look at. Broadly, I, I think uh, from an Indian context, uh, what I feel that there are two major gaps for fulfilling uh, the Agenda 2030 and meeting the SDGs. Uh, while Rita mentioned about the Niti Aayog and uh, the index that they've uh, formulated, which in fact is, is an amazing uh, uh, element that has come into this whole game and uh, something that not many countries are doing. 
but it also uh, emphasizes the federal structure of our government. Uh, but I think one gap which is coming up is uh, still for many of the important SDGs and certainly for the SDGs around climate change. Uh, the, the indicators are still not very well developed. And, and I think that is something that needs to be done uh, so that uh, the, the measure of success uh, can be uh, looked at uh, in an empirical uh, and objective manner. Uh, the second gap which I feel is that the states still need to adopt SDGs as their own. Uh, while it is an international goal, uh, all nations are committed to uh, fulfilling those goals, but we need to see whether most of the important goals have been translated into national policy or not. Uh, a lot of policy is there, like uh, Nana was just mentioning on, on water, uh, but I think those specific goals and targets need to uh, be brought forward as, as national policy and adopted both by the central and the state governments. And that's where I think uh, and that's the opportunity I see uh, from a COVID perspective that uh, this whole COVID pandemic has brought to the focus a lot of gaps that were there in the SDG implementation uh, to the forefront. And, and the fact that government would need to look at when they go for uh, building back better, they will need to see how these gaps are going to be addressed. Uh, there's no uh, denying the fact that the pandemic, for example, is, is uh, largely an outcome also for our lack of effort uh, over the last few decades on ecosystem restoration, for example. And I, I think in the post pandemic period, the fact that we are going to invest uh, and what we are now or the green recovery will need to focus a lot on uh, ecosystem restoration, climate change mitigation as key elements of any policy directive that a central or a state government, or for that matter, any other country in the world uh, would be bringing out. And I think that's one big opportunity that COVID uh, has, has provided as an impetus to SDGs. Uh, one uh, element which uh, I, 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 coming back to what Nana was saying, uh, the, the drinking water and uh, the water issues are something that also have been highlighted quite substantially uh, by uh, COVID-19. And if you are looking at the recent estimates, meaning at a global level, it indicates that almost uh, 3 billion people are without basic hand washing facilities at home. And, and 4 billion people lack any kind of social protection. So these are the two important indicators uh, and the goals in the SDGs, which really have come to the forefront uh, during this uh, pandemic. And the basic purpose of SDGs, which is a commitment to leave no one behind, uh, doesn't get served if we start looking at the kind of uh, figures that are uh, coming forward. So in, if, if anything, the SDGs will certainly become more important in the days and months ahead, I believe. Uh, the goals and targets that were set in uh, 2015 uh, will become uh, the guiding force uh, for post-COVID responses. The other big issue which I think uh, is, is going to come forward uh, is that while the global extreme poverty uh, is, is going to rise as a result of uh, COVID, and we haven't seen such increases uh, since the Asian financial crisis of 1981, uh, but I think the biggest issue that's grappling, and Mukund referred to, to, to that, and so did uh, Rita, where is the finance going to come from? And that's, that's something that uh, needs to be uh, really and finance not only for developing economies but finance even for the developed economies and while the developed economies may be able to uh, because of their stronger economic basis uh, address some of these uh, issues about uh, 
post covid 19 i think for developing economies it's it's going to be a huge huge challenge uh, obviously the two areas where the finance can come from are uh, uh, the government uh, public spending and of course the the private equity uh, or the private sector uh, but if we are looking at uh, the post covid requirements uh, for building back it runs into trillions of dollars so uh, on an annual basis so where, where does that money come from and and there is a lot of talk that has been going on and a lot of infrastructure and uh, thinking that has been put in place uh, about sustainable financing and nana was certainly part of one of the earliest efforts which unep did in india uh, with the financial inquiry i think the time has come that the thinking that went into that narrative at that time uh, needs to be adopted by the ministry of finance in right earnest i i think the time has come where some of that thinking which uh, nana's team at that point of time brought uh, fourth uh, needs to be looked at very very seriously and it's heartening to also note that uh, india and the ministry of finance department of economic affairs uh, has recently re-christianed one of their big units as sustainable finance unit and uh, the good news is that india has joined that eu platform on sustainable finance so i in terms of uh, the optics in terms of taking the right steps uh, there are some good efforts being made by the government and also the private sector would need to come into it in a big way but i think the time has come now and that's one lesson we are learning from covid the time for action has come i think we need to look at sustainable finance in a very very uh, strategic manner and also in in a way that some of the developmental needs in the post-COVID period are also addressed. Uh, India's uh, leadership position is, is obvious to all of us, and I think uh, all these efforts uh, need to be brought together as India assumes the presidency of G20 uh, in 2022. I think that would also give an opportunity for seeing that India is able to showcase how they are committed to fulfilling the SDG goals and the agenda for 2030. Uh, I will I'll stop here. Thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity. And of course, uh, Mukun's questions later on, I'll try to highlight some other issues. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Atul. And I think very important observation. And we're going to spend some time discussing sustainable finance, some of the key SDG indicators in the Q&A that follows. Uh, let me now Turn to Shankar Venkateshwaran. Shankar, can you to make your opening remarks, please? Yeah, thanks, Mukul, uh, and good morning to everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yep, you're fine. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks. So, uh, so I just want to uh, first step back a bit and uh, you know uh, give you a perspective of how I look at SDGs as a whole, uh, apart from what each of those uh, uh, 17 goals in the 269 uh, targets denote. Uh, I think there's, there's a, there are interesting uh, uh, interesting ways in which it actually influences the way we think and therefore how we should be thinking going forward. One is, I think, uh, the fact that the process of how the SDGs were made was very important. Unlike the MDGs, which was somewhat, if you like, top-down a UN uh, driven uh, kind of an agenda. What uh, made the SDGs different was uh, it was far more, uh, far more diverse in terms of the, the actors who played a role in it. So it wasn't just the UN system, it wasn't just the governments, it was cities, it was uh, companies. So I think uh, it was a far more stakeholder uh, led, stakeholder driven process. And therefore, to me, what that means is SDGs is something we have universally agreed to. Uh, and so to say that, you know, this is the government's role is not something that anybody could, uh, after that process, really say. Uh, it is everyone needs to play a role in that. I think that's, that's one of the, in my mind, a very big cornerstone of the SDG process. Uh, 
the other one is uh, I believe that it shows us a way out of getting out of a sequencing mindset. Uh, what I mean by sequencing mindset is generally there is a sense that let's first go GDP, whichever way it happens, and then let's worry about some of the other things. Or, or a comp at a company level saying, let's maximize our profit, let's keep going, then we'll worry about climate change and, and what happens to communities. What, uh, what the SDGs actually uh, tell us is that it doesn't have to be either or, it has to be both. That the way economies grow need to uh, factor in all these, all these uh, impacts. A way a company uh, goes about its business is not that you can keep sinning and then do 2% CSR, but the way you, uh, you build your business needs to be uh, holistic or inclusive. So I think, therefore, the, uh, this, uh, this business of getting out of a sequencing mindset is very important. So universality and the, uh, the, uh, the getting out of the sequencing mindset is therefore very important when we're looking at how we look at uh, SDGs post a COVID uh, situation. So it cannot be an either or. We are all in it together and we need to uh, sort of play a role. I think the other speakers uh, have already spoken about some of the fault lines uh, that have emerged uh, from the COVID experience. Uh, uh, obviously, SDG 3 on, on, on health is, is obviously a very important one in an Indian context for us. Uh, but also, I think, uh, you know, and I also wear the hat of uh, chair of Oxfam India, so for me uh, and for all of us in Oxford, India, SDG 5 and 10 are all very important uh, elements on gender equality and generally inequality in, in a larger sense. And I think these have been somewhat exposed uh, in, the way in, in COVID. And therefore, as we build back, we, we obviously need to have some amount of prioritization for this. But I would also... Uh, I think uh, importantly point out SDG 8, which is uh, the one on decent work, uh, because what the whole the whole situation and what's happening uh, with with informal sector workers, with, with the, uh, of which migrants form a big uh, uh, part of, uh, definitely does point us to the fact that that uh, you know this uh, this is a piece that we have not given enough uh, uh, attention to, and of course. Uh, SDG 11, which is sustainable cities. Uh, again, you know, we all knew uh, the, uh, how uh, how cramped our cities are. We all knew about how uh, uh, the slum clusters are growing. Uh, we all knew what is happening uh, in terms of uh, sanitation issues that uh, Rena talked about a short while back. This was all stuff that we knew. Uh, and had we actually dealt with it as a nation, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of spread of COVID, which is obviously very urban centric because of the nature of, of how it spreads, is something that, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe would have been a far less of an impact. So I think the, uh, there are huge lessons to us on many SDGs uh, that actually have come to the fore from this experience of COVID. And what it's telling us, in, say, in a sense, is that uh, if, if we, uh, that the way we need to build back better is to not get into a sequencing trap, but to make sure that as we build back better, we address some of these issues. And these particular fault lines that have emerged clearly have to have a lot of priority. Uh, I think the only, only uh, bits that everybody is happy about is some of the environmental impacts which have been somewhat positive. Uh, if, if people in Ludhiana can see the Himalayas and people in Delhi like me can breathe easily, uh, it is obviously a good thing. Uh, and, but the danger is as soon as uh, we go back to business as usual, will that go away? Uh, but but I, think, uh, uh, I think therefore there is an agenda for us to say that let's protect what we gain from this. But as we build back, we need to ensure that all the fault lines that have emerged and that are staring us at the face have to be very much part of the recovery. And we need to find ways to, to sort of ensure that that happens and it doesn't get left out. We, uh, so I don't think uh, compromising uh, any of the, uh, uh, the goals and targets is ever the answer. Uh, we, we can think about how we transition to get to those goals by 2030, 
and there might be some things we might want to do uh, uh, you know sooner in, in this in the next couple of years than later but that's clearly what we need to do going forward so i'll stop here mukund and happy to talk about this lovely thanks so much shankar and i think you touched upon a very critical issue this whole debate around uh, equality we'll come back to that in the q and a can i now request uh, alka talwar uh, to make her opening remarks please alka over to you yes, mukund uh, thanks uh, rita for uh, inviting me to this uh, webinar um, i'll just start off by giving a background I, though rita has already and you have already talked about uh, uh, the you know what's been happening um, I just want to reiterate uh, the fact that yes, the SDGs have in fact not only stalled. Uh, I mean, the because of the COVID, the SDGs have not only stalled, but in, in some case uh, have gone backwards. And uh, this is uh, itself is a uh, unprecedented, uh, you know, uh, uh, situation. It it is a crisis, uh, both uh, human, economic, and health, and uh, and it is uh, something all of us are grappling with. Um, we know that it is overwhelming our health systems and uh, our businesses and factories and and uh, and has severely impacted livelihoods uh, in india migrant workers we can you know we, uh, we we empathize and we understand what are they facing and uh, being in this whole forefront of uh, relief uh, and uh, work that we took up immediately uh, uh, you know actually dealing with these people uh, it it is shocking uh, it it just brings uh, uh, many issues to the forefront as uh, shankar mentioned the fault lines uh, that are there and that are actually uh, pulling us back and this is the this is the first time where we will actually see movement backwards towards you know the number of people who were above poverty line uh, dropping back and uh, and it's it is going to be a very very difficult situation um and uh, in uh, and in all of the uh, uh, all of the above uh, situations and when we start working there is one thing that we will actually really need to focus on uh, given the fact that the government has come with a heavy hand and uh, and uh, so just the fact that we uh, when we build, when we build back better we must look at how do we build our uh, you know stronger institutions uh, uh, you know so the whole concept of uh, the peace justice and strong institutions that uh, that sdg uh, we shouldn't miss that uh, piece at all uh, as part of the tata group you know we put together almost 1500 crores towards relief and uh, 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 and rehab uh, uh, to help the you know the government and and society combat covid most of it has been towards infrastructure ppes uh, getting uh, you know getting things on uh, ground uh, uh, having more isolation wards and all, all of those kind of you know better testing can we do all of this in india so all of that has been happening uh, but uh, coming to our own response i would actually like to uh, you know uh, take uh, take a few minutes and talk about four or five things that uh, have come uh, you know uh, come uh, had have become very clear to us when we've been working on this the first thing that i want to say is that the principles of sustainable development become even more important. Uh, uh, you know, things that uh, we, are, we are talking about, uh, resource efficiency, all the things that, you know, the SDGs are talking about uh, uh, ha have now become even, even more critical for us to really look at. Of course, health, uh, uh, infrastructure, clean drinking water, hygiene, these are the things where most, most of us will move towards because this is the need of the hour. We will be doing that right now. Uh, and uh, uh, and we will continue to support o o all of this. But the next thing, obviously, is on livelihood, and that's uh, where we have uh, st you know started moving uh, and looked at uh, our whole concept of skill development, getting livelihoods off the ground. This has taken such a big hit. I mean, uh, we cannot now get everybody together and uh, run a skill development program. So uh, it is pushing us back, making us think differently. This whole concept of digital, uh, can we do skilling which is digital? How will it impact uh, uh, the kind of uh, 
the new workforce that is going to come into uh, play, how will that impact and therefore impact all the uh, the SDGs related to poverty or decent work uh, uh, or all of that. So that becomes really, really important. What it also has brought to fall, uh, forefront is the, uh, the whole concept, of, uh, the sustainability concept of local networks. Uh, you know, uh, look at resource efficiency, look at how do you buy locally. You don't have huge supply chains where things are moving here and there. And we, <clears throat> we've, in a small pilots, we've seen, you know, you, even if you're creating PPEs, can it be local? Uh, uh, can it produce local livelihoods? Uh, if, if farmers are not able to take uh, food to the market, can you look at local uh, markets? Uh, and uh, is, is this, uh, is this a to look at new ways of doing things, uh, looking at more sustainable supply chains and new ways of doing things uh, uh, is uh, something that I would like to you know highlight out here. So local work is going to be very important. What will the migrants do when they come uh, back to their homes? So we will need local work. We will need local supply chains. We will need direct linkages for producers to market. And uh, all, all, all of these are opportunities of designing new social businesses or social ways of uh, you know new ways of doing uh, of setting up enterprises and uh, doing things digitization is obviously is, uh, has become such a big thing we're all working from home we're doing a webinar right now uh, uh, but uh, a very very important aspect of this digital uh, uh, thing is that there is a whole section of people who are now getting left out uh, we, are, we are trying to start education programs through digital you can only do it if the family has a, a smartphone and if the family is not well to do or uh, <clears throat> will then again, will these inequalities, this whole concept, the SDGs, which work on equalities and inequalities, will that take a hit? Uh, what will happen to the women? If they don't have a smartphone, then what happens to them? So all of these are the questions that we need to prioritize and look at uh, going forward. Uh, Mr. Bagai mentioned climate change, and uh, so these the the goals on climate change, uh, life below water, life. So uh, will this? Uh, they become even more important because we are seeing it's like a double whammy. You have all the impacts of uh, COVID, uh, uh, you know, and uh, loss of livelihood, and then we have impact of climate change. That's not going away very easily. Uh, I think, uh, and uh, here again, we need to have. A lot of focus on on these four SDGs, which uh, which sort of deal with environment, uh, and the fourth one being resource efficiencies, obviously. Uh, so I I think uh, the critical thing uh, going forward is this whole new way of doing business, collaborations. Uh, is this the time when we look at social business? Is this time uh, do we talk about uh, NGOs and corporates coming together, collaborating, working for uh, you know, uh, working towards a common uh, SDG uh, sort of uh, goal and getting it even sharper uh, in in terms of, uh, uh, you know, getting our achievements uh, happening. Because we do know that while the SDGs were there and we were making progress, we were not, uh, we were really not up there in terms of, uh, you know, the, uh, at the, the level of progress that it should have happened in the five years since the SDGs have, uh, have happened. So I, these are the few thoughts I had and I just, uh, I'll leave you with this and I'd be happy to take questions with, as we go along. Thanks. Lovely, thanks so much Alka. And I think you touched upon some hugely important issues and um, I, I think we'll get into a little bit more discussion in a couple of minutes on the whole digital narrative because you rightly pointed out that uh, it also has uh, potentially implications for people who don't have access to the infrastructure and particularly around uh, agendas like skills development, how do we actually make progress now? Uh, great points, thanks so much. Uh, can we turn to Renika, um, Renika Grover? Uh, and if I can request you to make your opening remarks and then we'll get to any of the panelists. Sure. Renika, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Mukund, and thank you, Fiki, for giving me this opportunity. Um, just before, I'm, am I audible? Because I'm having issues. Uh, there's some intermittent connection since morning, so there might be pos there might be a uh, time where the video just goes away. So just bear with me on that, because yeah, I can hear you fine. No problem. Please go ahead. Great. So 
Um, like, I mean, I just, uh, the best part to go now towards the end of, in the panel is most of the stuff is already said. So I just trying to recap everything. Uh, in terms of there's a, you know, there's a report that's come out uh, and this is the absolute right time to even be discussing about the SDGs because there was a report that came out recently which spoke about how India is grappling up with the situation and how the nine out of 17 SDGs, it's going to be difficult for it to attain. That's going to push its, uh, push its uh, 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 ranking further down. So it's kind of really, really pertinent because we have, you know, like when we're looking at SDGs, there's prevalence of poverty, there are frail healthcare systems, and there is also deglobalization and, you know, in terms of lack of cooperation, which is exacerbating the situation far more. There is also a World Health Report which came out, which spoke about how 11 million people are going to be in a, you know, a, a below poverty line. So all of these indicators kind of really, really up right up there. So what can we, what can we do to circumvent or what can we do to attain this uh, so that we meet our global targets by 2030? The one thing that um, came up was basically we look at immediate health response action to suppress this transmission, the pandemic that we are experiencing. And that kind of links with the SDG 3, definitely, but it also links with, aligns with the government's own agenda. When we're looking at the national agenda of the government, there are schemes such as Ayushman Bharat, which links with the SDG 3, but also the government's intention to increase its spending from 1.3% of the GDP towards healthcare to 2.5 in the coming years. That's where it sees that how it's going to really, really make a difference. And that's one of the critical areas. For us also, I say that because we are already working in the healthcare system for the trucking community, which is a mobile population as well. So it links the two together. The other bit which people have spoken about in this panel is focusing on particular groups. I mean, like women, youth, young, you know, youth, because we have a, a huge uh, younger youth population in India but more on the informal groups as well. So we have, we see this reverse migration quite a bit these days, and this is like really, really spoken about. So how do we tackle that? And this is where, again, um, it kind of links in with specific SDGs, uh, which is to do with gender equality or the decent work, which is SDG 8. So that's the kind of stuff that if we, and, and we see lots of organizations working on that as well, and there is a consistent work now, but these are the things which are really, really uh, critical. The one thing that is absolutely essential, which is spoken uh, earlier as well, is of course climate change. Now we know climate change in terms of impact wise and likelihood wise, it's really, really critical and very detrimental. In fact, there are lots of uh, messages in WhatsApp, you know, they were uh, going on in terms of talking about how uh, the earth is healing. And, um, you know, like there is, you can see the Himalayas from 300 kilometers away and the Ganges water is really, really uh, improved. And also in terms of, there was this, uh, that uh, a really interesting study by International Energy Agency talking about how the global greenhouse gas emissions are going to decrease by 8% uh, if, when compared to last year. But there is one really interesting fact over there which absolutely was critical and I just kind of, uh, you know, we were thinking about it and just reading it. It said that even though we've had this pure air, air quality, whatever, because of the, uh, you know, because of the uh, shut, uh, shutting down of the economy and then there's travel that's, uh, that's stopped as well, but still, we need 90%, over 90% of the decarbonization still require to meet the Paris Agreement uh, targets of keeping global warming to 1.5 degrees. So that's kind of a really, really huge revolution in terms of what's happening and at what stage we are talking about. So climate change, of course, takes the center stage. It, uh, it not only links, of course, with the SDG 13, but it's in terms of what exactly can be done by organizations, by government, in, in, and there is, again, this is also linked to some extent in terms of uh, clean energy, where there is, um, you know, the government's agenda on uh, 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 
national development agenda on in international solar reliance and how they're trying to promote it. So all of this is really, really prevalent. And one thing definitely is uh, we focus, we, we should look at is the SDG, SDG 17, which is more collaborations in this current climate, because this in order to reach uh, the 2030 agenda, this is something really, really pertinent and significant for us to look at. Uh, overall, I know we, uh, Mr. Bigai spoke about sustainable finance, so I would not touch upon that, but just I, there is just one thing where we see in the current climate where how ESG indicators uh, or sustainable funds in India gaining a lot of prevalence and in the last three months only there has been a huge surge of, uh, of funds. Uh, you know, the investors' interest in, in ESG indicators as well. So all of that kind of sums up in terms, in terms of what essentially we require to take forward and links in also, I mean, of course, I'm happy to answer any questions that come up because some of this is also linked to the work that we are doing in the organization. But I thought I'll just leave it over here since most of the stuff is already spoken uh, by the panel earlier. Lovely. Uh, thanks so much, Renika. We'll certainly come back to you with quite a few questions on, uh, from a corporate perspective, how you think about some of the strategies going forward. So um, I think uh, been through all the opening remarks of the panelists and some very important comments. Uh, I'm going to start with the question for uh, Naina and then Atul. Um, I'm just reading out from uh, a statement made in the Niti Ayog's document on SDGs, um, where they make the comment that uh, maintaining an average annual GDP growth of 8% in real terms is a critical element of the strategy. And it's critical because it's required to support the creation of remunerative jobs for new entrants to the labor market, as well as those facing redundancy in agriculture or other sectors. Now, both of you touched upon uh, the fact that there is going to be a scarcity of resources to finance what needs to be done. Uh, Atul drew attention, Nena, to some of the work you've done a few years back with the United Nations system. So if I could put it to you, if you were the finance minister of India, what would you be planning as we speak to find the resources, perhaps through reprioritization, to ensure the SDGs continue to be on target for 2030. Naina? Yeah. Let me start by saying, thank goodness I'm not the finance minister, because I really, my heart goes out to her in terms of the difficult situation that we're in, in terms of all that we want to do and need to do, and uh, how little ammunition we have in order to fulfill it. Uh, so I could only add uh, to, and you know, I don't want to repeat what's in the report, but we are actually, uh, uh, sadly, uh, very much where we were at the time when the report was written. Uh, there was a big uh, focus in the report on developing uh, bond markets, can, you know, where the ability of capital markets to deliver some of the funding was uh, underlying some of the ways in which funding could increase. And the work that you do, Mukund, and uh, Shankar does uh, helps because the capital markets become a great way to discipline companies. We have seen that in equity, where large, particularly foreign institutional holders, will not invest in companies that do not fulfill certain ESG norms. And the work that guys like you are doing uh, is only reaffirming that. Uh, likewise, debt markets can become a big disciplining factor rather than the way that banks, particularly in India, lend, where short shrift is given typically to ESG norms. Uh, many of us push to get banking norms through at a level which would at least define what banks should not fund. Uh, a very loosely worded document did finally emanate from the IBA and the RBI, but uh, uh, and it was AB supported by GIZ, GIZ and others, so at least it emerged, but it's still not where we want to be in the country. So we are somewhat dependent on foreign capital to drive these agendas for us, and to the extent that we can get a robust debt market and a robust equity market 
uh, it helps in terms of pushing through these norms, uh, which I, on capital markets in, in, and debt markets in India is still a failure. We've seen some progress in green bonds. The time when we did the report, green bonds were very new. And India has uh, looked at uh, raising money through those routes. Uh, I think very unimaginatively uh, invested most of it in renewables. So that was just the easy way to do it. There, if they can be far more uh, intelligent and interesting ways to depute green bond or green money uh, that encourages right behavior in companies rather than just pick the whole sector. Uh, and a lot of that has to be with the uh, whole tradition of consultants and uh, measurement, which again uh, uh, is growing, but again has not grown at the pace it's required because we need that audit, we need that measurement. So I think the seeds have been uh, uh, planted and capital, particularly foreign capital, is driving us directionally right. Uh, and now with India's dependency and need for this capital growing for the very reasons I've started out to say that we don't have elbow room in finance, maybe, maybe ensuring that these norms get built into the financing, that companies that want to raise this money recognize that unless they do things right, they're not going to get the funding. We will get the DNA of organizations changing towards the right ESG format. So I can only say that please push ahead with your agendas on the ESG front, because I think corporate India will have no option but to look at this because money coming from the banks in the country is not going to be readily available for what they need. Thanks so much, Naina. Uh, would you like to add anything to what Naina said, in particular, the importance of foreign capital? And I think the UN report also talks a lot about the kind of relevance that uh, overseas aid, concessional finance, all of this can have in the scheme of things going forward. Would you like to just flesh that out? Uh, Patul, have you unmuted yourself? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Thank you. Yeah, I was saying that after our potential finance minister has set out uh, such excellent uh, strategy and I totally agree with her. Uh, and I think that's what the Secretary General also uh, was was emphasizing uh, in, in his uh, <coughs> high level political forum uh, in, in this regard. Uh, I, I'm not a finance person, so I, I might be the wrong person to be asking all these things of debt equity and uh, green bond and things actually go over my head. But I'll, I'll give one example. Uh, and I think that's where strategic uh, policy options by the governments and by the private sector need to be looked at. In terms of where are we spending our money? Meaning the recent package of 10% uh, uh, of our GDP, uh, we, we've per force have had to invest that amount of money uh, in whatever form it was uh, for addressing a pandemic. And what if a situation was that this pandemic wouldn't have taken place, that amount of money would have been available to governments to look at the SDGs, which we were all talking about. And the example I'm wanting to give is, and this is a hard example from international diplomacy, is uh, the most successful multilateral environmental agreement till date in the last 35, 40 years has been the Montreal Protocol, uh, which has addressed the ozone issues. And it's called the most successful international agreement. All countries are parties to it. And one of the biggest successes, I feel, has been the way this agreement over the last 30 years has ensured that governments have finances available with them uh, in, in a very hidden manner in terms of cost, health costs that were saved as a result of this agreement. There are studies which have been done, though not for a developing countries like India or China, but at least for the developed countries that with the $4 billion investment in the last 30 years on Montreal Protocol, almost 
a trillion dollar has been saved on hospital costs, productivity, agricultural productivity, human productivity. Now, that money has been available to the governments uh, to address whatever issues they need to address. So I think that kind of investment, a strategic investment that can be done, and that kind of investment is really needed for, as I said earlier, ecosystem restoration biodiversity now. If we are able to spend, and had we spent a little bit more effort and money in the last 30 years, we would not have been able to get all this trillion dollars or more than that, which are needed by various governments. So I, I think a strategic planning like that is certainly an area which uh, the governments really and the private sector really needs to look at. Great point, uh, thank you so much. And I think it's worth sort of uh, noting that even in the, this climate treaty and the aftermath, uh, there's been so much talk about arranging uh, financial transfers to the tune of a hundred billion dollars a year from the developed world to the developing world. And so far, I think the amounts that have been transacted in whatever form, there's a lot of debate about the form in which this capital comes, uh, cumulatively has been uh, a very small fraction of that. So there is a strong agenda to push for significantly capital flows uh, from the developed world, somewhat in the lines of what was discussed and agreed uh, at the time of the Montreal Protocol on resolving the ozone depletion issue. Uh, Shankar, I'm going to come to you next. Um, and this is a point that Atul had touched upon on the indicators that we use for the SDGs. And um, what I found fascinating in the Niti Aayog document uh, was the fact that at least we have a bunch of targets uh, covering most of the SDGs. Uh, one can quibble about whether in some cases they are not aggressive enough. So for instance, SDG 1, we still have a target of potentially having 10% of our population living below the poverty line. And one could ask why that should not be 0%. Uh, in other cases, we question whether the targets are too ambitious. Uh, the Niti Aayog document suggests that at the moment, female labor force participation is 17% and the 2030 target is 100%. So are we ever going to get there? But leaving that aside for a moment, I wanted to ask you, uh, and perhaps wearing your Oxfam hat and the points you made earlier about equality, if you were forced to uh, pick, in a sense, a silver bullet that was going to target only one SDG. Which SDG would you focus on to ensure as much as possible is delivered on all the other very interesting uh, good targets that have been set across all the other SDGs? And just as a hint, <laughs> would it be SDG 5 that you made reference to, Shankar? Yeah, so, uh, thanks, Mokun. Uh, I would actually pick uh, uh, both SDG 5 and 10, uh, gender for sure, uh, and inequality in general. Uh, because to me, I think the uh, challenge uh, is, uh, is, uh, is access, is access to uh, the fruits of development. And we know for a fact that uh, access is not just a physical access or lack of access is not only a physical phenomenon, but is hugely a social phenomenon. So, uh, so whether it's a whether it's a resource like education, uh, whether it's a resource like health. Indeed, uh, uh, what Nana spoke about uh, access to uh, drinking water. All these are actually determined by uh, by your gender uh, and your ethnicity. Uh, that that uh, happens. So even if the key uh, is uh, uh, you know, as we keep enlarging the size of that cake, if the rules on how that cake gets cut don't change, then you're going to continue to have a larger cake cut in the same way with the same people getting more of that piece of the cake than, than a far more equitable uh, distribution. So, so clearly, I mean, I have no doubts in my mind that those are the two that I would do. Because I think that in, in a democratic uh, situation, that would enable and that would create the kind of uh, uh, pressures and pushes that you need to get something that makes sense for all rather than a few. Uh, so, so yeah, that those would be my picks. Uh. 
Thanks so much, Shankar. Uh, Naina, if we could come back to you for half a moment. <laughs> Um, on the question of 100% female labor force participation by 2030, if I challenge you, what is the one perhaps uh, change that you would like to see happening that could perhaps be instrumental in allowing that to happen or as close to 100% as possible by 2030? What is it that you'd like to see happening in India today? So that in that the corporate world, I think uh, the work from home is a big win, and uh, I'm hoping that women in the corporate uh, scenario will benefit from it. Uh, at a much more uh, wider level in the country, I think uh, you know I hate to link everything back to water, but we know well that it is the women who do all the fetching of water in homes and households. So it's the same way as uh, you know, the washing machine liberated women from sitting at home and scrubbing and cleaning and washing for half the day. Uh, we need water to be made available to enable at least that part of the drudgery of uh, daily work to enable women to step out. But the most fundamental change is, and actually it probably goes to Shankar's point, is uh, society. Because until society sees women as equal, and it is unfortunately not the case, uh, we will always have the challenge of women, yes, getting educated, and we're seeing that through government schools, uh, women and girls are doing extremely well uh, through the system, but the dropout rate as uh, they move out as educated youngsters is very high. And a lot of it happens from the pressures of society which do not allow her to continue at work, or if they allow her to, do not take away the day-to-day -day drudgery of running house and home. And sh better sharing of that has to change. So uh, we need much more work at a society level. Uh, 20, 30, 100%, forget it. I don't think we're there, near there, as uh, society changes uh, uh, so, so very slowly. I don't think the COVID environment will help because as jobs and the disruption and livelihoods uh, uh, go away, uh, there's going to be just that much more unemployment out there and men will be the first job seekers. So we need more jobs generally for everyone to step in. Having said this, uh, we can certainly be highlighting better uh, all those ASHA workers and community workers, which are largely women, the nurses, the caregivers, I mean, it's led by women. Uh, so let's recognize and laud that and worship them for what they are showing and creating. And maybe they become a source of uh, global skill that uh, the world can reach out to in due course. But, uh, I, I, you know, it's not my, uh, it's one of my most uh, emotionally connected SDGs, but not one which I lay a lot of hope by. Uh, I can tell you at a very simple level, just trying to get women on boards until the regulation changed, India struggled. Uh, and the regulation had to require it to get one woman on board, which is a pretty shameful number anyway. But, uh, you know, it should be two, it should be 30%. But uh, uh, it needed a full-on regulatory change from uh, the, the SEBI to enable uh, that to happen. Uh, so uh, that's um, a critical one. I just want to add on inequality and finance. Uh, I didn't mention the microfinance spaces and you know we, we work quite closely with microfinance for sanitation. And there is a huge problem in the country right now in terms of repayment, as you would expect at the microfinance level. But the microfinance institutions in the country are so critical in terms of financial inclusion. And women are big recipients of that through the self-help group movements, particularly in rural India, that I do think addressing this, ensuring that there's the helping hand of every institution in the country to ensure the survival of the microfinance uh, uh, organizations in the country is going to be critical. Perfect. Thank, thanks so much, Naina. In fact, I'm wondering if um, Alka, you'd like, like to also add anything to this discussion on gender equality. Uh, you've had a lot of experience with the self-help groups uh, in Gujarat, for instance, in UP. 
And I'm curious, uh, this issue of um, regulation, there is uh, a bill that's been in and out of parliament on several occasions for reservation of seats in, in parliament for women uh, parliamentarians uh, to try and push up that number. But already in the Panchayati Raj system, you've had a successful experiment, which is uh, initially taking the number to a third, and now the promise is to take it to 50%. How have you seen that working uh, in the areas that uh, Tata Chemicals, for instance, is very active? Do you have any uh, other suggestions or thoughts on how this 100% female labor force participation is going to potentially become a reality at some point in the future? Yeah, I, I have a different take on this. Uh, I think there is 100% participation of women in the labor force. It's just that they're not getting paid for it, uh, and which is the important distinction that I want to make. They are doing the most amount of work uh, across the board. Uh, it, it is just, uh, you know, that the value for that is not uh, available. And I think we have to start by valuing work and, uh, and uh, seeing that uh, there is... Uh, uh, just payment for uh, for the work that they do. Uh, in terms of uh, participation in governance, uh, uh, I think uh, it's been good and bad. There is a concept in Uttar Pradesh. There's a concept a concept of Pradhan Pati, uh, which is uh, which is obvious because it's uh, it, uh, it it says that uh, the Pradhan is the lady, which is a, a requirement. But the person who comes to uh, to uh, to all the meetings and takes decision is the Pradhan Pati. Uh, however, there there are instances where because of this, women have come forward. They have actually benefited. Uh, the whole self help group has has made them uh, more empowered, uh, uh, more vocal. They are talking about it and they're taking action on the ground. Uh, I see them all the time in uh, in. Uh, uh, in uh, many of the programs uh, we run uh, in Okai, we have, uh, 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 which is a handicrafts uh, social enterprise uh, that Shankar and I have been involved for, for a very long time. Uh, I, I see their participation. They're able to go to uh, government organizations and big, uh, uh, big, uh, you know, sort of events and talk about their, uh, the, the benefits that they've got. And they have definitely uh, got benefits out there. So, uh, so yes, uh, it's important that uh, 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 that uh, we recognize the, the work that is not paid for. Uh, that's one thing that we do, and uh, definitely uh, take it forward. There's also another concept of diversity, which I thought I'd like to, you know, sort of bring in because I do work uh, even in other chemicals. I work on diversity and inclusion, uh, where uh, the the we now sort of got to say, you know. 10% or 30% women in the say the the boards but uh, there is that missing rung in the middle uh, in in the corporate itself you know where are where is the pipeline and uh, how uh, do the women actually come uh, come forward and uh, as nena rightly said work from home is no longer a dirty word i mean you know we we had policies which we thought was uh, you know very very uh, progressive that you know women after childbirth are allowed to work from home and the pay is cut uh, but you know they're still continuing their uh, career and the break is not there uh, but now it's obvious that everybody can work from home and so can women with all the uh, the and i'm i'm hoping that this will bring uh, a change and we will not have the missing runs in between uh, in the middle management in the senior management levels where where we want them to be there it's the pipeline and that's really really critical uh, the other aspect is uh, uh, is uh, uh, in in many of the other places, in in uh, well-to-do corporates or big corporates, this would happen, and I'm still wondering what's going to happen in the MSME and uh, the other smaller uh, organization where this is not such an important agenda, um, which uh, the whole agenda of inclusion diversity uh, is still not center stage uh, in many organizations, and uh, I think uh, uh, we bring it up and. Uh, and uh, see that women participate. Another place where we worked on, uh, we have a program called Kasturi, where we're working on women farmers. For uh, for everybody, farmers means men. 
uh, and uh, so so there are no women agripreneurs or women who are involved in agriculture and i think that's an important uh, area that we need to focus on uh, and to get more uh, women on board uh, uh, and uh, and uh, you know be the earning uh, uh, the ones who are actually getting the value of the produce in their hands. It could be by uh, value addition, by doing many more things uh, in the agriculture space. So these are some of my thoughts on um, on women and uh, uh, equality. Yeah. Terrific. Thank, thanks so much, Alka. Um, I'm going to put my last question to Rinika, and then uh, we'll open it up to questions from the audience for a few minutes. Um, uh, and Rinika, really, um, I just wanted to check if you had anything you'd like to add to what uh, Alka and Aina just mentioned. And secondly, I think uh, from the perspective of your organization, I'm just curious how uh, how is governance of sustainability related issues, including CSR, viewed? Uh, to what extent does senior leadership get completely involved? How do you ensure that you cascade the understanding of the importance of these issues across the organization. Uh, if you had to make a dent in SDG, I think all of corporate India has to be passionate about doing something that makes a difference. And that requires a awareness and then be an incentive for everyone to play a role in really pushing towards these targets. So it would be great to hear your story sure. uh, on how your organization views this. Sure, great. thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, yeah, maybe just something on gender equality because we work a lot in gender equality as well. So there is a specific program that we run in Gujarat as well, which uh, when we're talking about providing livelihood opportunities to rural women who are underprivileged. So there what we've done in terms of we were talking about uh, microfinance institutions. So we've kind of been promoting that, but one of the key areas over there for us is to look at uh, farmers, which uh, uh, Ms. Talwar was talking about earlier. So we've been concentrating with women farmers. There is a agri-women cooperative society, which is only for organic farming and the biggest in Gujarat run by women. So that's the kind of emphasis and stress and work that we've been doing uh, with our women farmers in Gujarat. Alongside, it's not just about the work to, for them to be linked with markets and uh, have, you know, be more independent uh, uh, in, in their areas, but what we've been really, really focusing on is gender equality. So in the last five to six years, there's been a shift where earlier, there were social evils such as widow participation were really looked down upon. So recently, because of the work that we've been doing in the SDGs, uh, sorry, uh, not SDGs, um, in the in the self-help groups, there has been uh, that kind of uh, barrier has been broken where widow participation is allowed. Women have actually taken some kind of lead role in getting village infrastructure in place. So that's the kind of work, and there's a you know small shift that's been happening in Gujarat where we've been working for the last five six years and it's a huge it's a long uh, piece of work because you just can't expect these things to happen straight away in terms of seeing how uh, we are I mean you, your other question about uh, the organization in terms of where it's the SDG is so we have a sustainability management framework where um, it's there is a journey towards it and we've drawn upon certain uh, global standards such as ISO 26000, which is a social responsibility framework that we've put in place. And uh, there is, I mean, you know, there is a talk about how you embed SDGs into your core business strategy. So most of the work, let alone CSR, even in the sustainability arena, which is within the plants as well, is linked to SDGs already because the most important thing for an organization is to link its corporate reporting also to SDGs. So that's something there's been a shift on and the work's been very well uh, claimed and received. There is usual, like, of course, it, you know, uh, when you look at CSR or sustainability, so it gets, a, it's, there is an agenda in the boardroom discussion as well, the committee in place. So most of the work in the CSR world that we're doing is, is aligned with what's happening with, within what the CSR committee has to propose and what the CSR committee proposes as well. But more or less, the work that we are doing, which is aligned to the SDGs, and it's very well received by the committee as well, because there is a regular interval 
discussion and it's kind of uh, there is an interaction with the independent directors as well so that kind of transparency is there uh, and um, uh, overall in terms of taking pushing the agenda if there are certain things so one thing which we realized recently with covid happening was what do we do in the current stage where the net profits are going to decrease further and it's going to impact ongoing programs so what really was well received and just one, that the, on the last bit and then i'll uh, close it because i'm really cognizant of time as well i know we're all running past time what we did was we realized that we could not move divert our csr funds from the ongoing core programs because they, those were already linked to core programs or to the sdgs so it was about realigning and reassessing the budget in the current climate where we continue our focus on the four areas that we were doing ie healthcare uh, women empowerment and so on sorry so um so that's something we continued so what we developed was basically looking at the three r's where we provided the re relief operations but reshaped our current programs as well to make our communities resilient. So that's where we kind of reshape the entire program, uh, keeping in mind what COVID has brought in so that we could actually address the COVID issues, but yet continue our uh, program, uh, you know, fourth point program. And of course, we're looking at partnership models for that. And that's something we've been really, really concentrating on as well. I hope I've answered and I hope I'm audible as well because something. Yep. <laughs> This connection. No, no problem at all. We, we heard you quite well. Your video kept going off, but otherwise, no problem. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks very much, Renika. Um, I'm told by uh, Rita that we can request the indulgence of the participants for five more minutes and we'll close it. Uh, there are two questions from the audience. Uh, can I first turn to Santosh Jaira of KTMG and request him to? Uh, uh, direct his question to any of the participants. Santosh. Rita, does Santosh have to be unmuted or something? Yeah. Can IT unmute Santosh Jairam, please? Okay. Yeah. Audible. Yeah. Go ahead. Without this particular opportunity, so first of all, thanks for that. My um, two things: one was to any of the panelists to look into, and I take it up from what uh, Shankar uh, kind of uh, uh, mentioned that there are part among the when you look at the progress in the first few of the SDGs, uh, the SDGs uh, from 13 to 15 might things and the content being the underlying situation and all those things uh, shouldn't be prioritized actions uh, in understanding these dependencies and there need to be a much more thought process into that. So that was the first question. The second was uh, particularly to uh, Naina saying that local institutions you touched upon on green and social bonds uh, uh, and local institutions, maybe a municipality and all, uh, can't there be a sovereign institution act? Bond, SDG bonds, uh, which could be possible because uh, the local institution may not have the credit with us. So that's what I said, the sovereign institution back. Then. But of course, those were the two questions. Thanks. We on the first one. Uh, may I request Atul to perhaps give a point of view and then uh, Dana on the second one. Atul? Uh, I, I, uh, Mukun, can you just repeat? I didn't get it completely. I think he was just asking about uh, uh, how you prioritize the trust on the SDGs uh, when it's clear that resources are going to be in short supply and uh, you may have to make certain calls on what gets more attention immediately and what follows. So 
Thank some you. of the work that the UN has also done. I'm wondering if you have a view on, this goes back maybe to my question also on silver bullets. If, if there is only a limited kitty, where do you really place your attention? I, I, I think uh, the way SDGs uh, have been developed, uh, one of the basic elements of uh, the 17 SDGs is the interconnectivity. Uh, and that's that's the hallmark of uh, uh, these new uh, SDGs uh, and very different from uh, as earlier it was being said, uh, the Millennium Development Goals. So I, I think uh, uh, the advantage of this interconnectivity is that uh, while you could prioritize or focus on a certain uh, of the SDG, uh, there would be uh, uh, a lot of impact on the related SDGs. From my perspective, and I may not be very objective in that regard, and if, if I'm talking to a health sector specialist, uh, they may not agree, but I would feel that uh, SDGs relating to environment uh, are, are SDGs where if we could prioritize, and that's what I, meant, uh, I said earlier also, uh, it will have a widespread impact uh, along all the SDGs, meaning the nexus between environment and health is, is becoming so critical that if we are able to address the environmental mitigation issues, our health linkages will automatically get addressed. For example, if you take climate change mitigation or you take air pollution, or if you take uh, AMR for that matter, so I, I, I think that interconnectivity, which is there amongst SDGs, is a very, very important element that should be exploited. Thanks, thanks, Atul. Uh, Naina, uh, uh, revert on his other question. Yeah, Santosh, uh, uh, hi. And, you know, I, I couldn't agree more in terms of social bonds being an answer to something. But uh, I should just tell you that uh, we struggle to get scale from these bonds. You know, issues of 20 crores, 30 crores, $10 million don't get us anywhere in the big uh, scope of issues that we have to solve. So, uh, uh, you know, some of the work that uh, Grami Trust and others have been doing is very helpful and in the right direction. And we must continue to do uh, with uh, the support of the UN as has been happening. But I don't think it's going to be the, the big support me, the only way we're going to tackle this is if it becomes the DNA of the country and the DNA of every player in the country, every responsible corporate, every responsible individual, and of course, government itself. And finance has to be a critical way to achieve and more attention to be placed not on funds we raise for an SDG, but funds which are not available to those who do not conform to basic standards and norms, whether it's to do with environment or water productivity or water reuse, we need to set those norms and audit them to the point where no finance is available to those that cut corners or do not achieve. And uh, uh, let me just uh, end with that. But you, that's in those, you know my views on some of this anyway. Lovely. Thanks so much, Naina. Uh, we probably have time for a last question from Pankaj Satija of Tata Steel. Pankaj, uh, can Pankaj be unmuted and uh, pose this question, please? Am I, Am I audible, sir? Yeah, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Sir, my point is that uh, when you talk about industry and the community, Industry always prioritize climate change as the first priority because media also ask questions related to climate change. Whereas we go to the community, they take the first priority at the zero hunger. And when we talk to the government, they take sanitation as the first priority. I know that each one has a positive impact on uh, another, but if the all the stakeholders can converge together at deciding the priority, probably we can achieve the targets much easier. That's my point, sir. Uh, great point. Uh, maybe Shankar, just a quick observation on that point, and then I will uh, hand over to Rita to conclude proceedings. Shankar? Uh, 
Yeah, I think I think the point is well made, uh, and I think it also links to the point that I was making about the interconnect. I, I I think what I would only just say is that uh, when we talk about prioritization in general, uh, I I think it should not be uh, it should not be a zero one. That is, we prioritize one and ignore the other. Uh, that can never be the way you make priorities. And the second, I think, important principle is that even if you're going to do something earlier than the other, so you have the decade ahead of us for 2030, you might want to do something earlier. That's a fine way of prioritizing rather than saying let's not do anything. But the second one is while we're doing those priority ones or the high priority ones initially, I think the principle has to be that you cannot be negatively impacting any of the others. Because that is then a reversal of, of the feedback. So whether, uh, and I think the point is well made, you, know, you will have contradictions, you will have different vested interests, if you want to call it that, pulling for one or the other. Uh, I think in some way in a democracy, you have to resolve those. Uh, but you certainly cannot, uh, for example, say, I want growth at the cost of environment. I mean, to me, that's a false choice. So do no harm has to be a basic underlying principle. And around that, you can work around uh, uh, the, what you need to do earlier in the decade and what you need to do later in the decade. That would be my quick response. Lovely. Thanks so much, Shankar. I think we are well over time. So, Rita, over to you. And of course, my sincere thanks to all our panelists for a fantastic interaction. Rita, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Rajan. It's uh, indeed been an excellent discussion and of course amongst the many many issues and suggestions that the esteemed panelists have made i think the importance of local networks the importance of focusing on the supply chain on uh, ecosystem restoration uh, of course uh, you know harnessing the uh, capital markets for financing and the opportunity to change the DNA of organizations to align with ESG norms, designing uh, new social uh, enterprises, and uh, a very, very important point on gender equality, diversity, and inclusion as uh, really the, the core uh, you know, focus areas to move forward with the SDG goals despite the impact of COVID-19. And last but uh, not the least, the importance of prioritizing the SDGs without negatively impacting uh, each other will be uh, the way forward for governments and all stakeholders and the emphasis that all stakeholders will have the role uh, to play in uh, the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, so those have been the most important highlights of today's discussion. And on behalf of Fiki and all of us, we are very grateful to our esteemed panelists, Ms. Nenalal Kidwai, Mr. Atul Bagai, yourself, Dr. Rajan, uh, Mr. Shankar Venkateshwaran, Ms. Alka Talwar, and Ms. Renika Grover. And thank you to uh, the audience for patiently listening in. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.